Hello there, my fellow wide-ranging servants of the Imperium, and welcome back to some 40k lore. Today, in our third episode, I think, from the Liber Xenologus, we're gonna see what this guy and this book have to say about the abhumans of the Imperium. However, there's a bit of a twist. While I assume most of us typically think of ogrins or maybe ratlings, when they hear about abhumans, in truth there is actually a lot more of them, and some of these not even I have ever heard about before, at least prior to this book. So today we're gonna go over no less than 10 abhuman subtypes. Unfortunately, as expected, not all of them have official or canon artworks, so I'm gonna do my best to compensate. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us quote. Wisdom, strength of character, nobility of spirit. Do not look for these things among the abhuman kin. The distrust and revulsion with which they are met is justified. However, in the following pages, I hope to illustrate the value of these deviations from the genetic norm. Among the oldest Terran houses, such as my own, there is a collective understanding of the strata and protocol that define us. This understanding breeds confidence and the ability to command. Among humanity's lower orders, though, confusion often leads to unnecessary fear and racial tension. The Imperium survives on its ability to adapt, and the many species of abhuman employed by the Astra Militarum and the Imperial Navy are an invaluable weapon in its arsenal. Unsanctioned mutation is a dangerous abomination that will spiral out of control and destroy all if allowed to take root. But a human who is simply adapted to survive an environment can be utilized rather than be feared. The determining factor in this, where unsanctioned mutation has no logic and no end, sanctioned up humans are a stable, fixed point of aberration. During my travels in the western reaches, I have encountered several breeds of abhuman, and, repulsive though they are, all of them have proven useful in some regard. Through my discourses with the rugged, resourceful denizens of Precipice, I have also learned that there is a far wider range of abhumans than I previously realized. I did my best to capture all of them here for it is only by grasping the full extent of these genetic variations that we can utilize our true military might. The Ogrim, or the Homo sapiens gigantus. Probably the most ubiquitous strain of abhuman, these lumbering simpletons are a familiar sight in almost every imperial battle line. Their strength is as legendary as their stupidity and some of them are so large and so powerful that they wear pieces of tank tread and armored chassis into battle. Their strength, in fact, can sometimes be their downfall. Ogrin weapons like ripper guns, slab shields and the like have to be manufactured to the most simple, robust design so that they can survive being handled by these clumsy goliaths. Ogrin's loyalty to the Emperor is well known, and they will not balk at even the most horrific enemy but one must always be careful to address them in the most unambiguous terms. They obey each order with infuriating literalism. There are other, more sinister risks associated with these brutal abhumans as well. The small mind is easily filled with faith, they say, and the Ogrins are undoubtedly the most loyal of our abhuman warriors. They do not believe that the Emperor is a vague metaphysical entity. They believe he is quite literally with them on the battlefield, and he may well appear in their mess hall handing out medals. The childlike simplicity of their faith might make it appear that they are impervious to corruption, but even such loyal, unsophisticated souls can be perverted by heresy. They are turned from the Emperor's light through the use of mind-altering substances, doctored combat stims and even surgical implants. Once in the company of the damned, they are prey to all the grotesque spiritual aberrations that inflict every other renegade. And, if anything, idolatry and irreligion leave the Ogryn even more brutal and unstoppable than they were before. The Longshanks, or the Homo sapiens elongatus. 
the ability to inhabit even the most alien environments is one of the many ways in which humanity has flourished and endured where other, less immutable empires failed. Longshanks are unnaturally tall humans who have evolved on planets whose mass has resulted in a weaker gravity than that on Terra. Longshanks may be observed in many different auxiliary regiments and they are difficult to miss, towering over their fellow guardsmen like giants in a children's story. If heavily armed and armored, they can make an imposing sight, and their elevation gives them a useful vantage point. Their long stride also means that they are able to travel across the rain at great speed. Their lofty position, though, can make them an easy target for enemy fire, and thus they must be deployed with care. The Felinid, or Homo sapiens hirsutus. I have to acknowledge that I got no personal experience in this particular variant. I have heard this name mentioned on many worlds, but doubted there was any truth to such fanciful tales. I once met a hunter in the Yuri sector who offered to sell me the carcass of a felinid, but when I examined the thing it was clearly a fake. A grotesque collection of human remains and animal hides stitched together and preserved in formaldehyde. However, when Grek saw me working on my notes, he assured me that felinids not only exist, but they are the form of humans he most respects. He tells me he fought against them, and found them to be the most efficient killers he had ever seen, in a Militarum regiment anyway. Apparently, they show a lethal cool in the face of even the most brutal opposition. When asked if they were bestial in appearance, Greg revealed that he finds it difficult to distinguish one human from another, and that felinids, to his eyes, look no different from me. He also mentioned that they had claws the length of my forearm though so I decided Grek was not entirely a reliable source. The Afriel Strain, or Homo sapiens maledictus While most ap humans have mutated as a response to an environmental stimuli, some have been genetically altered in an attempt to maximize the inherent potential within the divine human shape. The Afriels were intended to clone the attributes of the greatest imperial heroes. They are hominids bred to surpass normal guardsmen in every respect, faster, stronger, more intelligent, and able to face enemies that an ordinary, non-augmented human would balk at. However, altering their genetic makeup had unforeseen consequences. Afriels, still to be found in some war zones, are universally reviled by their comrades, and famous for their bad luck. It is clear to me that great men were born to inspire lesser men, but attempting to merge the two via genetics was a fool's errand. Then again, imagine a regiment of sly marbos. The next one is probably one you're more familiar with. It is the Rattling, or the Homo sapiens minimus. I have encountered these diminutive abhumans in the Militarum Auxiliar regiments across Segmentum Pacificus and always found them to be crude, ill-mannered scoundrels with no regard for sexual continence or personal hygiene. However, I have also found them to be marksmen of great skill, and tenacious survivors who seem capable of enduring the most hellish combat zones with great ease. I have learned to suppress my natural prejudice and utilize their skills. As well as their accuracy with a sniper rifle, they often have a comprehensive knowledge of every scam and deceit that is taking place in a war zone. In my experience, if you want to know what is really going on in a regiment, the Rattlings can provide you with the greatest detail. I have employed a pair of Rattlings on several of my expeditions into the Blackstone Fortress, and they have proved useful, if boorish, companions. Rain and Rouse appeared at first glance to be cowardly self-serving wretches, but I have also observed in them the relics of humanity's better attributes. They would each fight to the death for their brother, and for all their grumbling, they show a greater resolve that would put many godmen to shame. The Gland Warrior, or the Homo sapiens Auctus Glandulae just like with the Afriels, gland warriors are humans who have been deliberately altered by genitors of the Magos Biologus. They have developed a whole host of organs enhancing their capabilities, giving them increased muscle mass, aggression, pain tolerance, and an immunity to many lethal toxins. 
However, their psychological enhancements often have a detrimental effect on their mental stability. I employed a Gland War veteran during one of my exploration of the Blackstone Fortress. The place has a habit of unearthing and magnifying the flaws in one's psyche, and the Gland Warrior, who began the expedition as a useful slab of arm muscle, quickly descended into a psychotic mess of paranoia. He attacked me after deciding that I was one of the genitors that experimented on him, and he made a damn fierce opponent. If it hadn't been for a timely and brutal intervention from Greg, I might have not survived it. The Trough, or the Homo sapiens verdantus During one of my expeditions to the Blackstone, I encountered a slave trader who claimed to have visited a world called Verdant. He told me of the legend of a tribal king called Nemus, whose people were isolated from the rest of humanity in the years before the Great Crusade. According to my source, during these dark times, Nemus swore an oath to protect the planet if the planet would protect the people. As a result, Nemus's descendants, the Trough, share a symbiotic relationship with the forests of their home, enabling them to converge with their environment and confound invaders. Over many centuries, this has, allegedly, transformed the appearance of the Trough, creating peculiar, arboreous abhumans with flesh that is as tough as oak and digestive systems that can extract nutrients out of the soil. I guess we found Groot's planet of origin. I will be honest, I cannot vouch for the veracity of the slave trader's story, but I included it as an interesting side note. The Neandor or the Homo sapiens Hyanovus. Just as a muscle wastes if not exercised properly, so may the finer attributes of mankind wither if not properly nurtured by the influence of the noble classes. On planets where the lower orders are left to fend for themselves, without the improving presence of high-born masters, a tragic regression will take place, both spiritual and physical until all that remains is a primitive form of humanity known as a Neandor. These lowbrow savages would serve no purpose at all, were it not for their impressive physical might. The Neandors have limited language and intellect, but some commanders have found that by harnessing the muscle of these brutes, they can free up their more quick-witted troops for more combat duty. The Sub or the Homo sapiens deformum some strains of abhuman are so mutated that they become repellent in the eyes of normal men. Skin that resembles rusting metal, heads sunk so low that their face peers from their chest, limbs writhing like serpents, eyes radiating dazzling light, and so on. Their existence is tolerated in some quarters, as their mutations are stable and harmless, but that does not make their appearance any more palatable to their countrymen. The subs are usually the victims of ministorum purges and they live in perpetual fear for their lives. However, during my travels, I encountered several groups of subs which, despite my initial revulsion, I found them to be devoted adherents of the Imperial Creed, eager to seek redemption in battle. Also, their mutations, while hard on the eye, often have some practical uses on some planets enabling the subs to endure local conditions in a way that off-worlders would not. Subs have nothing to lose but their soul, and as a result they have the potential to be zealous warriors. But where they are hunted and purged, we steer the zeal in the wrong direction, creating an underclass of enemies that are spread across supposedly stable domains. Subs are more widespread and numerous than the High Lords realize, and I believe our priests and witch hunters are in the danger of stoking a fire which will catch them unawares when it finally takes hold. And finally for today, the Pelager, or Homo sapiens Ochanus. In the innermost reaches of the Blackstone Fortress, there is a lake of tar called the Gonsalvo Trench. Many explorers avoid it, unable to traverse the inky depths. But on one of my earliest expeditions, I encountered an inquisitor by the name of Callisto at the very edge of this lake, surrounded by various relics that were clearly dragged out of the liquid. She was reticent to explain her success, until we realized that our fathers were both members of the same fencing academy. 
It is wonderful how people of class and breeding can stumble across one another, even in these most uncultured regions. After this revelation, Callista was happy to demonstrate her method, and summoned a pelager from the lake. Bellot, or Bello, I guess, is a youth of around, I would guess, 20 years old, and hails from a planet that is submerged almost entirely underwater. Thus, his ancestors evolved the ability to breathe almost any liquid. The most striking thing about him, however, is not his gills or scaled skin, but his musculature. His people live deep beneath the surface of the sea, where the pressure could crush a normal man. As a result, Bellot is a hulking mass of iron-hard muscle, more similar to an ogren than a regular man. When, at Callisto's suggestion, I struck him with my weapon, it was like attacking an armored car. Bellot clearly has other kinds of mutation too, but before I could investigate any more, the fortress underwent one of its violent transformations and we were separated. I am very keen to learn more about this fascinating kind of abhuman, but this event occurred several weeks ago, and if the rumors are true, Inquisitor Callisto failed to return to Precipice. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to narrate for you on the Liber Xenologus and what it had to say about abhumans for today. Funnily enough, judging by some of the examples we explored today, I would imagine there's even more types of abhumans that we're never gonna hear about. Considering the way that the planet can shape its inhabitants, starting from today, we can probably assume that the word abhuman means a lot more than just ogrins, rattlings, or felinids. Anyway, if you folks enjoyed learning about all these, and if you want to tell me which you found most interesting, you can write it down in the comments. If you found this informative or entertaining, do leave a like, share, subscribe, and click the bell icon for future content. Thanks a lot, and the Emperor protects.